Walking the Earth between 130,000 and 40,000 years ago, the Neanderthal is perhaps the most famous species of hominin known to man. From movies to songs and books, their popular persona as cavemen is no new concept. However, who really were the cavemen? Were they as dumb as the media says? And how is it possible that you might have a little caveman DNA in you? Stay tuned to find out. The Neanderthals were the first species of fossil hominin ever discovered, and since their initial discovery, they have grown in popularity, holding a place in the collective minds of science lovers and non-science lovers as the oh-so-popular cavemen. First found in 1829, they were not initially recognized as a possible human ancestor until the second half of the 19th century, when more fossils were discovered. Since then, thousands of incredible fossils representing the remains of many hundreds of Neanderthal individuals have been unearthed from sites all across Europe and the Middle East. These remarkable discoveries include the remains of babies, children, and adults up to around 40 years old. Thanks to these findings, we now know more about this fascinating human ancestor than any other in history. The earliest known Neanderthal remains were discovered by the Dutch-Belgian prehistorian Philippe Charles Schmerling in 1829 in what is now called the Schmerling Caves in Belgium. There, he found a child Neanderthal skullcap named Ingus II, along with other skeletal remains that puzzled him. Unable to find a suitable answer, Schmerling believed the remains belonged to a poorly developed human buried alongside extinct animal species. In 1848, the Gibraltar One skull was discovered in Forbes Quarry by Lieutenant Edmund Henry René Flint and presented to the Gibraltar Scientific Society. Initially, it was thought to be a modern human skull and its significance as an archaic human was not recognized until later. Years later, the most famous and pivotal discovery occurred in 1856 in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf, Germany. There, quarry workers found bones that included a cranium, thigh bones, and parts of a shoulder blade and ribs in the Kleiner Feldhofer Grotte. Upon seeing the bones, local school teacher Johann Karl Fulrot recognized the bones as distinct from modern humans and presented them to the German anthropologist Hermann Schaffhausen for study. In the end, Schaffhausen and Fulrot concluded that these bones represented an ancient form of human, distinct from today's contemporary populations. The species was named Homo neanderthalensis, meaning human from the Neanderthal Valley. Following the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species in 1859, Fulrot and Schaffhausen argued that Neanderthals were an ancient form of modern humans. However, their work met significant opposition, notably from pathologist Rudolf Virchow, who insisted the remains represented diseased modern humans rather than a new species. Virchow's erroneous interpretation delayed broader acceptance of Neanderthals as a distinct species until the end of the 19th century. By the early 20th century, numerous Neanderthal remains had been discovered across Europe, solidifying their classification as a legitimate species, Homo neanderthalensis. A key discovery that helped this was the discovery of La Chapelle or Saints I, also known as the Old Man in France. Following its discovery, French paleontologist Marcelin Boulet authorized detailed studies on the specimen, and although his work helped the Neanderthal to be accepted as a species of its own, his reconstruction was wrong, as he depicted Neanderthals as slouching and ape-like, reinforcing the image of them as primitive and distant from modern humans. Sadly, the 1912 Piltdown Man hoax further misled researchers by presenting a more modern-looking human ancestor, which seemed to support Boulet's depiction. Despite Boulet's influential but inaccurate portrayal, other scientists began to challenge this view. For example, Scottish anthropologist Arthur Keith in 1911 reconstructed La Chapelle aux Saints I as more human-like, with tools and cultural artifacts. And although Keith's interpretation did not gain immediate acceptance, it laid the groundwork for future re-examinations. Thankfully, in the end, the exposure of Piltdown Man as a hoax and the re-examination of La Chapelle aux Saints I, whose slouch was due to osteoarthritis, led to a more nuanced understanding of Neanderthals as intelligent and capable, with behaviors and cultures similar to those of modern humans. Today, the Neanderthals are typically classified as Homo neanderthalensis, though some consider them a subspecies of Homo sapiens. Overall, Neanderthals are now seen as a complex and intelligent species, as ongoing research keeps refining our understanding of their place in human evolution. 
but that's history. The next question should be, what kind of environment would force our closest relatives to evolve as they did? Our closest ancestors, the Neanderthals, evolved and thrived in a world that was anything but stable. The period from about 65,000 to 25,000 years ago, known as OIS-3, was marked by rapid, severe, and abrupt climate changes that had extremely profound environmental impacts. Sadly, despite being physically adapted to cold conditions, the Neanderthals faced extreme and unpredictable shifts in their environment within their lifetimes, leaving little time for their populations to recover. It was this same unstable climate that played a crucial role in their evolution and eventual extinction. Due to their environment, the Neanderthals had to develop a wide range of survival strategies to cope with the extreme conditions. Archaeological records show that they lived in small, mobile groups, which allowed them to exploit different resources and move away from deteriorating conditions quickly. However, the dramatic climate changes of the OIS-3 period would continue to have significant impacts on Neanderthal populations. This is because the harsh conditions at the time caused many local populations to dwindle or die out entirely, making it difficult for Neanderthals to sustain themselves over long periods of time. As time went on, humans adapted, as even small advantages in biology, behavior, or lifestyle could mean the difference between life and death. As the Neanderthals struggled, modern humans arrived in Europe and had a wider range of adaptations, which may have given them a competitive edge over the Neanderthals. Interestingly, evidence suggests that the replacement of Neanderthals was not solely due to direct competition with modern humans, as severe climate conditions made Europe inhospitable for all human populations living there, leading to widespread population declines about 30,000 to 28,000 years ago. However, modern human populations in Africa survived and later recolonized Europe, while Neanderthals, who were not present in Africa, sadly became extinct. The evolutionary history of Neanderthals is complex and intertwined with the broader human lineage. They are thought to have evolved from Homo heidelbergensis, a common ancestor shared with modern humans and Denisovans, before populations became isolated in Europe, Asia and Africa. The Neanderthals developed distinct features over time, marked by periods of gradual change and adaptation to their environment. In fact, Fossils dating back to around 450,000 to 430,000 years ago already show distinctive Neanderthal dental features, indicating the early stages of their evolutionary path. As to how they evolved, two main hypotheses explain their evolution, namely the two-phase model and the accretion model. The two-phase model suggests that a major environmental event, like the Sali glaciation, which was a significant ice age during the Middle Pleistocene epoch, caused rapid changes in Neanderthals. According to this model, first, their body size and robustness increased quickly to adapt to the cold. Then, this initial adaptation was followed by further anatomical changes, helping them survive in those harsh conditions. On the flip side, the accretion model proposes a slower, gradual evolution, divided into stages, each reflecting adaptations to specific climatic conditions. The Neanderthals and Denisovans, another species of humans, are more closely related to each other than to modern humans, suggesting that their split occurred after their common ancestor with modern humans. Genetic studies estimate the Neanderthal-Denisovan split around 473,000 to 381,000 years ago, likely before hominins spread across Europe. These early populations, sometimes referred to as Neanderthals, may have interbred with even earlier human species already present in Europe. Essentially, Neanderthals evolved in a challenging and changing environment that shaped their physical and cultural adaptations. Their interactions with their environment, coupled with their biological and behavioral strategies, were largely successful because of their resilience and adaptability, two traits that truly defined what it means to be human. However, the severe and abrupt climate changes ultimately played a significant role in their decline and extinction, paving the way for modern humans to become the dominant human species. So what did these cavemen look like? When it comes to looks and anatomy, the Neanderthals possessed a distinct anatomy tailored for survival in their environment. Their bodies were generally shorter but more robust compared to modern humans with males averaging around 168 centimeters or 5.5 feet and females slightly shorter at 156 centimeters or 5.1 feet. 
the Neanderthals' robustness extended to their muscular build, as they were heavier and more muscular than their modern counterparts. But that was not all, as their brain size was notably larger than that of modern humans, averaging around 1,500 cubic centimeters. This brain size was likely a result of their heavier and more muscular physique, as well as adaptation to cold climates. The distinctive shape of their skull featured a long and low profile, with a rounded brain case, a prominent occipital bone at the back, and a depression for strong neck muscles. The Neanderthals also had thick brow ridges beneath a flat and receding forehead, and their mid-face projected forward, giving them a distinctive facial appearance. Their jaws were larger and lacked a projecting chin, with teeth that were larger than those of modern humans. They also had robust limb bones with large joints, indicating strong musculature in their arms and legs. Their shin bones and forearms tended to be shorter than those of modern humans, which is typically an adaptation to cold climates. The pelvis of Neanderthals were also wider from side to side, potentially affecting their posture. But that was not all. Genetic studies of the species shocked the world, as they provided insights into Neanderthal adaptations and characteristics, including their unique metabolism, hair, and skin color. According to the studies, they likely matured faster than modern humans, had higher basal metabolic rates due to their muscular build, and were more active in dim light conditions. The Neanderthals had lighter skin to adapt to low sunlight levels, and genetic analysis suggests they may have had a range of hair and eye colors, including red hair and even fair skin. Keeping with the theme of being human, the Neanderthals were not without their health challenges, showing evidence of injuries, infectious diseases, and genetic disorders. In fact, traumatic injuries were common, with a high percentage of specimens showing signs of healed major trauma. But that was not the only problem for the species, as inbreeding may have led to low genetic diversity and increased susceptibility to birth defects and diseases. Disturbingly, there was also evidence of lead exposure in the fossils that suggested there were life-threatening environmental challenges at the time. In order to understand what the Neanderthals ate, we first have to examine their oral hygiene, or more aptly, lack thereof. It should go without saying that the Neanderthals didn't have toothbrushes. This seems obvious, seeing as they were cavemen, but this singular fact was a stroke of luck for today's scientists. See, the lack of prehistoric dental hygiene resulted in teeth gunk that would not only shock your dentist, but also contain a gold mine of information on their diet. But what makes teeth gunk so important and valuable? Well, without regular brushing, a thin sticky film made from proteins and microbes forms on the surface of teeth, known as dental plaque. Over time, plaque hardens to form tartar or dental calculus, composed of calcium phosphate minerals with occasional magnesium or iron. This very process is what gives them their value, as encased within the hard mineral crust, tiny bits of microbial and food matter can be preserved for thousands or even millions of years. Thanks to these bits, scientists can examine the teeth to determine the species of microbes and the types of food Neanderthals consumed. For instance, DNA from dental calculus in Neanderthal teeth found in the Spy Cave in Belgium revealed that they ate meat, specifically woolly rhinoceros and wild sheep. However, for the Neanderthals, this is no one-size-fits-all diet, as what they ate varied by region. For example, in the El Cidron Cave in Spain, dental calculus showed a more plant-based diet, including mushrooms, pine nuts, moss, and tree bark. Essentially, the Neanderthals were not exclusively meat eaters. Astonishingly, the dental calculus also provides insights into Neanderthal health and medicinal practices. For example, one Spanish Neanderthal had a dental abscess and carried the DNA of Enterocytosune bianusi, a gastroparasite. This individual also had DNA of poplar bark, which contains salicylic acid, the active ingredient in aspirin, and traces of penicillium mold, suggesting possible self-medication with natural painkillers and antibiotics. Bacteria encased in dental calculus also do a little more, as they reveal information about Neanderthal microbiomes. See, the Neanderthals had Methane brevibacter oralis, a bacterium also found in human mouths, indicating potential saliva exchange between species. Essentially, the moderns might have kissed, or at least shared food with the Neanderthals. 
A genetic analysis of Methan brevibacter oralis in Neanderthals revealed that the ancient versions lacked genes for antiseptic resistance and certain sugar digestions. This basically tells us that Neanderthals had different diets and hygiene practices compared to modern humans. Their diets were less rich in processed sugars and they didn't use antiseptics, which over time led to evolutionary changes in oral bacteria. As human diets evolved and hygiene practices became more sophisticated, our oral microbiomes adapted, reflecting the ongoing interplay between human evolution and our microbial companions. Now that we know what they ate, the new question is how they live their lives and how it mirrors ours today. When it comes to Neanderthals, their way of life was like anything before and by far strongly showed us the primitive version of who we are today. The Neanderthals likely had the neurological capacity for speech, as evidenced by the presence of the FOXP2 gene, which is a crucial gene for language development. But that's not all, as they also possessed a hyoid bone, which is a U-shaped bone in the neck that supports the tongue, and closely resembles that of modern humans. This suggests they could produce a range of sounds similar to those used in human speech, essentially facilitating complex communication. Perhaps one of the most shocking things about the Neanderthals is that they demonstrated a variety of cultural practices. They engaged in burial rituals, indicating a possible belief in an afterlife or spiritual world, with intentional burials often including grave goods, such as tools and animal bones, pointing to a ritualistic or at least symbolic behavior. Besides believing in religion and having burials, the Neanderthals showed an exemplary mastery of a fire, See, fire played a crucial role in the lives of Neanderthals, significantly impacting their survival, social structures, and technological advancements. Essentially, their mastery of fire enabled them to thrive in diverse and harsh environments. For example, fire allowed Neanderthals to cook food, making it more palatable, digestible, and safer by killing pathogens. This enhanced their nutrition and supported their robust physiques. Additionally, the fire provided essential warmth during glacial periods and in cold regions, improving comfort and extending their habitat range. It also served as a deterrent against predators and possibly hostile groups, ensuring safety at night. In terms of technology, Neanderthals used fire to improve their tools as heat treatment enhanced the quality of stone tools, making them sharper and more effective, while fire-hardened wooden spears became more durable for hunting. Beyond its practical uses, fire was a focal point for social gatherings, facilitating communication, storytelling, and planning hunts. Overall, fire was indispensable to Neanderthal life, shaping their dietary habits, technological progress, and social cohesion. Speaking of hunting, it was a vital aspect of Neanderthal life, essential for sustenance and survival. See, Neanderthals were skilled hunters who used a whole array of tools and strategies to capture prey effectively. Their hunting techniques likely involved both solitary and group efforts, as they employed ambush tactics, stalking, and even persistence hunting, where they would chase prey over long distances until exhaustion. Owing to their robust physique and endurance, coupled with their knowledge of terrain and animal behavior, the Neanderthals were not just hunters, but formidable hunters. To hunt, the Neanderthals crafted sophisticated tools, including spears, javelins, and stone-tipped wooden weapons. They also used sharpened stones and wooden clubs for close-range combat. Today, evidence suggests that they hunted a wide range of animals, including large game like mammoths, bison, and deer, as well as smaller prey such as rabbits and birds. Successful hunts provided Neanderthals with essential protein and fat, supporting their high-energy lifestyle and enabling them to thrive in challenging environments. But that wasn't all, as hunting also fostered social cohesion within Neanderthal groups, as cooperation was necessary for effective hunting expeditions. In fact, evidence suggests they engaged in cooperative behaviors within their groups, such as caring for injured individuals and sharing resources. Besides hunting, the Neanderthals also faced competition from Homo sapiens and other predators, which eventually shaped their survival strategies. In the realm of art, it is believed that Neanderthals engaged in symbolic and artistic activities. They created cave art, including abstract shapes, handprints, and animal depictions. They also had personal ornaments made from bones, shells, and teeth. 
as well as body decoration and art made from natural pigments like okra. The Neanderthals were also believed to have enjoyed music, as it is believed they used simple musical instruments crafted from bone or wood to produce rhythmic sounds that resonated within their communities. These musical expressions could have served social, ritualistic, or even communicative purposes. The Neanderthals, much like us today, also saw the necessity of clothing as they fashioned garments from animal hides and furs, tailored to suit their needs in diverse environments. For them, clothing also served as a form of expression, reflecting individual and group preferences while contributing to a much larger social identity. Essentially, the Neanderthal's life was a complex interplay of group dynamics and environmental conditions. This was also evident in how they dealt with other species, as today, their intergroup relations have shed light on the complex social dynamics of Neanderthal communities. While they likely had territorial boundaries and occasional conflicts, evidence also suggests cooperation and cultural exchange between different groups, as trade networks may have facilitated the exchange of goods, ideas, and genetic diversity, contributing to the resilience and diversity of Neanderthal societies. This intercoordination did not stop there, as the Neanderthals were also believed to have mated with our direct ancestors. Genetic evidence indicates that Neanderthals and Denisovans interbred with each other, as well as with early Homo sapiens populations, as they migrated out of Africa. This interbreeding, however, was a blessing and a curse as it resulted in the exchange of genetic material between these hominin groups. Today, genetic studies reveal that up to 2.4% of non-Sub-Saharan human DNA originates from Neanderthals, while even individuals with Sub-Saharan ancestry carry traces from later Eurasian migrations. Today, the Neanderthal genes we carry have bestowed upon us both advantages and disadvantages as some genes honed over 300,000 years of Neanderthal evolution bolster our immunity against local Eurasian pathogens, while others promote fertility and protect against miscarriage. However, some traits, like increased pain sensitivity and susceptibility to certain diseases, may have negative consequences in the modern world. For instance, Neanderthal DNA has been linked to conditions like Viking's disease and autoimmune disorders. Moreover, certain genetic variants increase the risk of severe illness from diseases like the infamous COVID-19, essentially showing us that the complex legacy of our ancient relatives still very much plays a huge part in shaping our health and molding our future. In the end, our closest ancestors are exactly what we call them, as they displayed a lifestyle and adaptation that figuratively and genetically continued to live in us. From appearance to lifestyle, they were the first to truly show what it meant to be human. And it's upon their legacy that we stand today and have built our society. But try as we all might, there is no denying that we all have a little caveman inside us. But what do you think? Are cavemen really just cavemen? Or have we barely scratched the surface of what they could do? Let us know in the comment section below. And while you're at it, why not hit the like and subscribe button to learn all about the wonders of prehistoric times. Until next time, bye.